Hello, what's up everybody? My name is Camry HD and welcome to the street scene. As we gather, please register on the chat by sharing your name, pronouns, and where you are. And please answer this question. What is your artistic practice or creative outlet? This workshop will be recorded and posted. If you wish to rename yourself and or have your video off, do that now. The small group breakout rooms will not be recorded or posted. If your phone is on drive mode, change that now. You can see our links and share with your fellow workshop folks by clicking the chat in the Zoom window in the bottom left of your Zoom screen. You will see a little microphone icon, icon where you can mute and unmute yourself. So please stay muted unless you're speaking. If you want to see those sharing or presenting more clearly, choose speaker view in the top right corner of your Zoom screen. If you want to see all the workshop folks, click gallery view. You can switch this back and forth during our time together. Tonight, we want to explore, no, sorry about that guys. And now that we are gathered, I again welcome you to street scene number six, our sixth and final Autorism Virginia Zoom workshop. To create materials, skills, and agreements for the environmental and justice communities of Virginia. Tonight, we want to explore how we can lift our voice, our truth, and our causes up during the COVID-19 pandemic. What is the most effective artivism you have seen since the pandemic altered our lives? Start thinking about that because most of tonight is going to be us solving those challenges together. But first, we are honored to welcome Dustin Klein, lighting designer and projection manager, whose recent work at the Robert E. Lee statue Marcus David Peters Circle in Richmond, Virginia has inspired all who have witnessed it. Take it away, Dustin. Hey everybody, I'm Dustin. Thanks again for being here and thanks for inviting me. Really happy to be here sharing what I'm doing. Um, it's a little about me, you know, I've been working concerts for about 10 years and um, since COVID-19, there's not a lot of concerts. Um, so I've been participating in the Black Lives Matter protest. Um, probably saw some of my work projecting on the Lee Monument. Um, it blew up yeah, kind of in the media a bunch. Um, I'm going to show you guys some pictures just a little bit in case you haven't seen it. Um, but basically, the idea of this whole project was to kind of give some recontextualization to the monument. Um, you know, they were definitely built in name of segregation and keeping people separate, you know, to uphold slavery. Um, so, in, in my opinion, too, seeing them still in this way, not recontextualized in any way still kind of like promotes the original ideas of when they were built. So I think it's important that we like do something to them, whether take them down or change them or, you know, recontextualize them in some way to just kind of make them more for everyone in a sense. So that was a lot of just the purpose of it. Um, just want to let you kind of know what's going on with the project too. About three days ago, um, the city had passed some ordinances where they're not allowing generators or audio, vi audio video equipment in the park. Um, right now I'm like the last two days I've been on private property still projecting on the monument. Um, they pretty much not letting people camp out in the park anymore overnight. Um, but there's still been a bunch of protesters that are staying there getting kicked out. Um, so that's what happened last night and probably going to happen again tonight. Um, so we will see what happens. Um, but enough of that. Basically what I really want to get across is, you know, let you guys be able to do your own kind of projection mapping projects for yourself, you know, to get, make a big sign and kind of like, you know, get your messages out there how you want. Um, so projection mapping for beginners, here we go. Um, you think about a projector, it's a lot like a camera in reverse in some ways where you have, you know, a projector basically, I'm gonna come back out of my screen capturing for a second, uh, just so you can see my face more. Um, but you know, a projector pretty much works just like a camera where you have a lens and it's outputting an image, just kind of the opposite way thing. Um, so depending on the lens that you have, depending on the kind of projector you are, have, it's gonna basically go to a different spot. Um, so you gotta think about it, you know, you might have, there's a ton of different projectors out there. You know, you could probably pick up a, a bunch of different ones and you gotta just kind of look at what kind of projector you have and how it's gonna throw light out of it. So some of them throw really wide, some of them throw really thin. Um, and the way that you'll know this is by looking up your projector on the internet and typing in something like a throw calculator. 
I'm going to share my screen again. Um, and basically for every projector out there, you'll be able to find something like this on the internet where it can be like, hey, my image is going to be this size when the projector is this distance apart. And this is very crucial because some projectors shoot at a very wide angle and some projectors shoot at a very thin angle. So sometimes you need to be very far from what you're projecting on, depending on how big you want it. So you got to think about it like there's this magic triangle that's leaving your projector that's going to what you're projecting on. And you got to decide how big it's going to be and how you're going to basically get this like box that your projector is shooting to be as focused on the what you're shooting on as possible. So let's say, you know, the Lee Monument, for example, is a very tall, not very wide. So what we got to do is turn that projector 90, like you're taking a picture, you know, on your phone or something like that. You want to basically frame that light as close as you can into whatever you're projecting on, and that will get it as bright as you possibly can get it. Um, so, you know, I'd like to be like, hey, there's just one easy way to do it, but every projector is different. Everyone has a different kind of lens on it. Everyone's going to take a different amount of power. So you just kind of got to look at what you have and, you know, use that to, you know, what you're projecting on. It's going to make a big difference. Um, when you're looking for a projector, how bright it's going to be is going to make a big difference. You want it to be at least 3,000 lumens. That's what you measure how bright a projector is. If it's going to be below that, you're probably not going to see it. Um, the one I've been using at the Lee Monument is four and a half thousand lumens. Um, they make them up to 40,000 lumens, but those get very expensive too. So it's just a matter of like your bang for your buck, how bright you want it to be. Um, and then of course the lens is gonna make, make you basically choose how close you're gonna be to what you're projecting on. Um, so yeah, it's kind of like, you know, a lot like a photographer, you know, has a lot of different tools to make a photography, you know, make a picture look great. You know, you can make it really technical if you want to, but you could also just kind of take out your phone and, get it to where it needs to be and click it. Um, so very similar to that thing where it can be a very complicated thing or it can be a very simple thing just depending on how complicated you're trying to make it. Um, so you know you have your projector and you have your lens and you have you know you got to think what am I projecting on? Like I was projecting on a monument um, so I had to be kind of very specific about where the light hit that monument to make it work. Um, but if you're like projecting on the side of a building, let's say, or something very flat and bright, it might not be, you don't need to be as worried about like what angle the projector is going at or like the precision of what you're actually projecting on. Um, so a big thing to be is like, look at is like, what are you projecting on? You know, are you projecting on a white wall? Are you projecting on a dark wall? Obviously anything that's lightly colored and in the dark is going to show up a lot better than something that's darkly colored or being washed out with light. Um, so you got to look at where you're projecting, you know, if there is ambient light, can you block that light maybe? Can you put a big flag between where that light is and the wall that you're trying to project on? Um, can you maybe cover a light? Is someone willing to turn a light off? Um, again, the only reason the stuff of the Lee Monument worked is because the protesters or somehow the lights that lit up the monument were no longer there. I'm not exactly sure. I wasn't there when it happened, but it's very dark now. So they magically disappeared and that makes it a great spot for projection now. Um, other places, not so much. So that's a, a very big thing is like how much ambient light is there versus how strong your projector actually is. Um, a couple different ways you could power it. Um, you know, maybe you're someplace and you can run a logging extension cord. That's obviously an ideal situation. Um, maybe you have a small generator that you can pull from. That works good. Um, you can get maybe a power inverter for your car that you can run off the battery. That way you can maybe park somewhere and just run your car and run it off that. A lot of projectors would definitely work for that. Um, yeah, so it's like, you know, a bunch of different ways that you could power it, just depending on where you are and, and what you need to do. Um, Let's see, for, you know, how are you gonna get this content on this projector? So depending on your projector, there's, you gotta think about, it shoots a bunch of pixels and it's got a thing called a resolution. And you gotta think that resolution, like basically a big grid. Um, so most projectors are gonna be 1920 by 1080 pixels across. Um, but some of them are different numbers of pixels across. So if you look at your projector, it's gonna have a resolution. And if you make a graphic that is that resolution, 
let's say it's like 1920 by 1080, um, and you put that up there, it's not going to stretch. So, you know, depending on what projector you have, you just want to match the resolution of your graphic to it. Um, so let's say your projector is sideways and it's normally a 1920 by 1080 resolution, you want to make your graphic 1080 by 1920. Um, and it'll still work if you don't do that, but you might, it might not look like you thought it did on the screen when you upload it. Um, so if you do that, it'll always kind of not get stretched in that same way. Um, so, you know, there's a bunch of different ways that you could play your graphic back to it. You could bring a laptop and you can just run like an HDMI cable out of your laptop into the projector, um, change your media, you know, let's say you have PowerPoint, let's say you have, um, you can just put a picture up and just, you know, play the picture up, um, play a video file, a bunch of different things, you know, find something to loop. Um, a lot of projectors will actually have a function where you can put media on a USB drive. Um, so you can maybe put like some slides or a picture on a USB drive and just plug it into the back of the projector and go to the menu and you'll find that like um, you can actually just play that picture on the wall without actually having a computer there at all. Um, another way to do it, if your projector doesn't do that, they make, um, they make a bunch of little media players, you can call them. If you just Google media player, it's basically that function where you can just put a little graphic on a USB drive and plug it into your media player and attach it to your projector. And that way, maybe you're worried about the cops taking your laptop or something like that. You've got this $30 media player that's just playing this graphic off, uh, or you know, it's a lot cheaper than you know, maybe your $1,000 laptop that you don't want to leave out or bring out to the protest. Um, yeah, there's um, another big thing. Um, I put a, there's these really great mounts that you can build that are made of film grip gear. It's um, on the link that I think was shared with this. Um, but you can basically make a projector mount that can go like any which way. And it's very useful because like your projector, when you're doing mapping and you want it to maybe project on something specific, you really don't want your projector to move. You want it to be as still as it can possibly be. So just something that keeps your projector very still um, and these mounts that I shared, like you can pretty much attach them to anything. Um, like you can attach it to a car, you can attach it to a pole. It's pretty much like anything you can find, you can attach to it and then position the projector in any way. Um, and they're like under $150 by the time you get all the parts together. Um, so that's really useful, especially if you need to, you know, do something really fast and throw up a projector and get it in the right spot and then get it down really quick. Um, Let's see, I uh, put also on that link a Facebook group that's called VJ Union Global. That's pretty much like every single video artist that I know in the world is on there. And if you look up their search section for any video related questions, you can pretty much find any answer that you'd ever want to know on there. And if it's not there and you ask, someone will definitely answer you. Um, so that is a huge, awesome, great resource for anything visual, video related, mixing video, um, all sorts of psychedelic visuals if that's the thing you want to get into too. And um, great resource for just projecting in general. Um, and I think that's pretty much the basics of what you know what would be you know just projecting the signs of what you'd want um i use a software called mad mapper i'm going to share my screen again um it's very useful you can rent it or buy it i think it's only like ten dollars a month to rent um but basically it treats the output of your projector so you can kind of move things oh this is not the video one second and also, if you Google Mad Mapper, there's a bunch of tutorials and stuff like that. But this basically allows you to kind of take what would be a flat plane and mimic something to maybe go on an angle, or like you could create text in here and then move that text to a particular spot. So, like when you see maybe pictures of the monument that I had, and you see, um, you know, no justice, no peace, you can basically kind of like create that text. And let's say the projector is projecting in this whole area. And I want to say, like, we're going to put this text right here um, so I can just kind of like click on this surface and then move it, you know, to wherever that is in the projector. So again, this, some of this stuff costs money. There's probably free alternatives too um, that can kind of do like a similar thing on that. 
but that kind of helps you be a little bit more precise after you place the projector and you can kind of just use the full output to put it where you want versus like trying to mount that projector like in the exact spot to uh, hit the screen that you want. Um, but yeah, I think that is pretty much my basics of projection mapping presentation. Um, if y'all want to ask me questions, I happily will answer them. Sweet. That was awesome, Dustin. Um, if you guys, like you said, if you guys have questions, feel free to ask. If you um, look beside your name, you'll see a little hand icon. If you click it and I see it raised, I'll go ahead and call you. You can unmute yourself, ask your question, then mute yourself again and he'll answer it. Uh, Justin, I have a question. Um, you mentioned at the very beginning of all this that the city of Richmond just passed an ordinance banning AV equipment from the park. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Do you know more about that? Yeah, I I don't know exactly, to be completely honest. Um, so they put out a memo that basically said in Robert E. Lee's circle, you couldn't have AV equipment. Um, I don't know. Technically, where we were projecting from wasn't actually in the circle. We were actually in a median across the street from a circle. Um, so, you know, I'm not sure that we are actually violating that because we're not technically in the park. Um, but I do know that where it was set up, a wall of 100 cops would have came straight through me last night previously. So I was glad not to be there. Um, definitely would have been in the way. Um, but the driveway was great for the last two days. It was very nice of this woman to let me set up there. Um, I'm not sure what's going to happen in the future. I'm looking for some legal advice. Yeah, and I think we have Mara. I think she has her hand raised also. Hi. Yes, I did have my hand raised. Um, so. I would like to know how you come up with messaging because the messaging on the Lee statue has been absolutely brilliant and very applicable um, every time. I mean, really, I've been following it. But projecting on, say, a statue of an unknown soldier in a one stop light county is going to be different in terms of messaging. So, do you collaborate? with people as far as messaging? Do you come up with it? Like, how, how does that work? I have been doing a lot of collaboration. Um, one of my best friends from high school, um, his name's Alex. We've been working on content together this whole time. Um, I kind of convinced him to just kind of come help me set up as a helper. And he was a history major, so he's got a lot of good information about that kind of context. So that's been really helpful. A lot of this, this movement in particular you know, I've been trying just to attend protests and kind of see what the messaging of the protest is and just amplify that message, especially like as a white guy, you know, supporting the Black Matter, Lives Matter movement. It just kind of made more sense to just do what I could to amplify the messages I agreed with that I saw and just kind of like help support those things versus really trying to dial it in on my own. Um, but, you know, like stuff like, you know, Harriet Tubman and like, um, you know, Frederick Douglass and just stuff like that, you know, just trying to I guess, recontextualize, like I said before, and give that kind of history to those monuments. Um, you know, we've had a lot of people come up and send me suggestions and just, I've asked a lot of people, you know, being out there every night doing projections, there's been a ton of people that have come up and been like, I'd like to see this, or this is cool. And, uh, you know, a lot of ideas that shouldn't go up there too. So, you know, it's been, um, uh, it's definitely been just trying to like, listen to what is out there. And, you know, a lot of it's like, you know, I'm used to running for a crowd of people and trying to figure out like what that crowd of people wants at that given moment and trying to just like, you know, create that kind of image or that feeling that makes sense for what's happening in that time. You know, like um, yesterday, actually I can show you guys a video. Um, we projected Rosa Parks and the RVA bail fund. Um, here's the line of police and the protesters and Rosa Parks and the bail fund number, um, just because, you know, to support civil disobedience and just kind of made sense with the sit-in for them doing in this park. Um, so just trying to kind of like just look at what's happening on a daily basis and kind of tailor the messaging that makes sense for that. Um, and every cause and every 
surface is going to have something different that makes sense for what that is. And the bail funds uh, for Virginia are in the links below uh, and will be in our chat also. I can't Freddie figure Carr. out how to raise my hand on the chat, but I have a question. <laughs> um, Dustin, first of all, I saw that you had a gallery of um, images that um, we didn't really get very much time to look at. Could we have a moment to look at those? And also, have you ever tried to project on a body of water or on a forest? And how do those kinds of natural scapes work? Oh, yeah. Um, unfortunately, here, I will show you guys more of work. Um, I have projected on water. It is unfortunately, most of the time, it's a reflective surface. So I guess uh, you tend to want to project on something as flat and non-reflective as possible, because the light, you know, actually, instead of landing on the water, ends up going to wherever it's perpendicular to that water and reflecting onto it, much like light reflecting off water, exact same concept. Um, they do make these things called water screens. That's essentially like they shoot up water. It's kind of like when you hold your thumb to a hose and it makes a very flat plane of water and you can actually project on water through it that way. Um, but it's expensive and not easy to produce on a normal thing. Um, for trees, you know, I projected on a lot of trees and it can look, it's very hard to get messaging across. Like you can get text if you're far enough away. It really has a lot to do with how far away you are from the projector and how flat your plane is. So let's say you have a very projector that like very bright projector that's very far away. Um, and most people that are looking at it are from far away. That will be visible. But if you're projecting on a tree from far away and most of the people are maybe closer to that tree, they're probably not gonna make out that imagery quite as well. So a lot of it's like perspective and where people are actually viewing the image from to how much it will actually translate. Um, and here's some of the other work I normally do. Uh, this was Red Rocks um, last year. I had these giant diamond video wall stuff with all these lights around. Um, See. This is the buttons that I normally press to make all the stuff happen. Lots of MIDI controllers and buttons and faders and helps to, the band I work for also is an improv band. So they play a different show every night and they're always changing. So I have to be able to change the content with them. So that's why there's so many buttons and things like that. Um, this is a cave in Tennessee. It's really cool. You can do concerts on the inside of a cave. Hopefully get to go back there sometime soon. Um, yeah, lots of rocks, projected on lots of rocks and stones apparently. <laughs> um, yeah. We have any more questions? I guess we are good. All right. And now for our work on the question before us this evening. How can we lift our voice, our truth, and our causes up during the COVID-19 pandemic? What is the most effective artivism you have seen since the pandemic altered our lives? Lainey Sullivan, member of the Sunseen Collective and of Holy River and a Richmond environmental activist will lead us in a brainstorming session. Take it away, Ms. Lainey. Hey everyone. So yeah, we're going to spend a little bit more time in chat today. Um, so if you don't want to chat, that's totally fine. And you can just exit or you can hang out in the waiting room with Kay and, uh, and wait for us to come back because we're going to share our ideas. So we're going to break out into groups and um, you'll be invited on the screen to go into the group. And there'll probably be groups of like four-ish people. And we're going to talk about so COVID has really changed our landscape as activists. A lot of us are normally on the street at meetings and, and doing things together, yelling. We can't really do it in the same way. And, and sometimes people do choose to do it in the same way and that's their choice. But um, this, is, this exercise is to think about what is some of the most powerful art that you've seen recently during COVID? Um, artivism, you know, political art that's shifted something in you. And maybe share with the group 
one really powerful thing that you've experienced that has shifted your perspective. And we will analyze what other ways we can produce art to, um, to give voice to our causes. Um, and then we'll come back, have someone in your group be kind of like the note taker and they will report back when we get back in chat. And um, when we come back, I, I wanna encourage us all to dialogue about it. So you'll get a, um, also just by the way, um, if you're gonna talk about things that are illegal, this is not a secure line, so please be mindful of that. You can talk about theoretical things, but just Zoom's not super safe. So let's, let's keep it um, on the broad, broad frame. So Kay will be sending over our chat invitations and we'll see you back here in 15 minutes. You can use that to either respond to what people are sharing or to comment and your own thoughts. And so um, we're just going to take some time to, to share about what revelations we came up through with our group. Um, who would like to go first? You can like raise your hand in real life because I, I can't find that raise hand button. All right, there you go. Oh, Silas, you're first. Nice. You say hi. 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 <laughs> hi All right. Oh, you can't see me. Um, so I took some notes, but Emily, do you want to speak? You already muted yourself again. Um, I will go ahead and report what I managed to get down on paper. We talked some about how to reach communities that don't have internet, good internet service, um, and which is an especial challenge during a pandemic and how we can potentially bring music to the streets um, or have a kazoo parade or, um, this is also related to, of course, courthouse statutes because we're thinking a lot about that right now. Um, it was pointed out that sometimes finding a place that's safe to walk is a challenge. And we also talked about how we link environmental racism with racism because right now, despite the fact that we are still in the middle of a climate emergency, there's also a lot of other things going on like a pandemic and, you know, cities burning down and that sort of thing. So it's, it's really important, I think, for us to be able to make those links. We talked about creating some sort of symbol to indicate to others that, you know, we're here to have a conversation, to meet our neighbors, um, evidently, and maybe Kay could expound on this, that, that hobos used to put marks on houses to indicate safe spaces. And so maybe there's some sort of symbol that we could use to indicate that, you know, this is a, a safe space that we can bestow that grace upon our neighbors. Um, and let's see, um, we talked some about, and again, I wanna hear more about this, during the first New Deal, as opposed to the Green New Deal, they used to act out headlines. Um, so all of these things were sort of structured around the idea of during the age of pandemic, when it's already a challenge to, to protest, how do we deal with the additional challenge of rural communities that don't have reliable internet access? So anything to add group? We had a really good discussion. Josh, I saw you with your hand up earlier. Sure, yeah. Um, I was in a group with uh, Stephanie and Dustin and Camry and we discussed a few things that we'd seen recently that were really powerful. Um, of course, uh, the elephant in the room being that one of the really powerful things has been these uh, projections on the Lee Monument. And um, Stephanie also mentioned having seen a photograph recently that had been treated in a way to draw attention to it, I think, on social media. Um, Stephanie, would you be able to describe that photograph a little, 
probably better than I could. Yeah, sure. Um, it was a photograph that was done black and white in front of a statue, and it was referencing um, black slaves that were used to experiment on um, by the father of gynecology, who was credited for starting the medicine of gynecology. And what it was is it was black women and they were in hospital gowns and everything black and white, except for hot pink on their hospital gowns to represent the blood um, from you know the carnage and the pain and most likely bleeding out back then that they would have experienced in you know, infection and death. Like I thought it was just a really powerful still image that encompassed so much in that image without having to even have any words on it um, at all and kind of drew attention to uh, a very important part of the narrative that is not being discussed or doesn't have a whole lot of light shed on it, which is uh, the way in which slaves were used um, by the white supremacist system uh, and the ways that they were harmed and the trauma that kind of has passed down in generations. So I, but I thought it was, I thought it was beautifully done um, the way that they did it. Um, yeah, Stephanie, thank you. Uh, in addition to that, uh, Dustin had talked a little bit about um, the presentation that uh, I think Dustin, you said it came, it, it had been organized by Black Lives Matter of uh, a projection of, of dozens of people's faces who had been killed at the hands of law enforcement um, that was projected on the monument. I, I hadn't seen that for myself. Um, but I think then you also mentioned the, the photographs that had been laminated and, are, and arranged around the monument, uh, which I just, I, when I found that out, I was, thought that was really powerful as well. Yeah, it's definitely a, definitely a beautiful, sad memorial in a lot of ways. Um, but it's, uh, you know, it's been interesting to see a community come together with a common goal of grievances and turning it into the communal space. Um, I think that's why a lot of people are so upset with the new restrictions because it's been such a beautiful communal space of free speech um, that I think people want to keep it that way, which is why these protests are kind of, people are staying in the park past when they're supposed to to try to you know, speak up against it. Um, so we'll, we'll see what happens with all that. But, um, yeah, I just want to take the time too to say thank you to everybody for having me and everything. And that it's been really awesome giving presentation and just being here and that uh, Yale's organization is wonderful and a great thing that you guys are doing. So keep at this for sure. <laughs> well, uh, Dustin, our, our group also had um, several people mentioned, including me, the, the, the projections on the monuments. Um, that's been really uh, brought, I think, really uh, national, even worldwide attention to Richmond uh, at this time as, uh, uh, you know, hopefully it will make an impact uh, uh, on top of uh, the people in the streets uh, that will make a permanent change for the better. Thank you so much. I hope so. Thank you. Happy to contribute how I can. And thank you all for all contributing to do what we all can. You know, we all, all work together. We can make some changes, right? <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody else like to share? So there were four groups. I think we've heard from three. Yeah, go go, Maya. Uh, some of what we talked about in our group was about the just the purely online stuff, Instagram and um the way that there there's some Lenny you were talking about stories and um information just real teaching kind of stuff that's being put out in graphic ways uh very concise very artistic and and um kind of even yeah just really really accessible um and talking about the intersectionality of environmental and social justice in that way um, and how the sky is the limit in terms of how media amplifies, like we're saying, you know, the projections on the monuments here and whatever else we want to do along those lines, how those things just get amplified by 
um, how they're shared um, on social media. And then we were talking about dance and uh, and and movement songs and those kinds of things that can be shared online. There, there's um, something Maya took part in recently where people from all over the world got to do water dance and do their own improv in the middle of a, of a piece that the, the beginning and the end were given and everybody did. So it bonded everyone together and then everyone posted their individual piece. So there's just this kind of amazing opportunity for global connection through, through, uh, through dance. There's certainly been a lot with singing online too. So, um, yeah. So I'd like to talk with anyone about what we might do in Charlottesville with our, with our statues and with the freedom of speech wall and just how evocative that can be. So, yeah. 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 Me too. Mm -hmm. Take them down. Hey, oh, I was wondering, Mandy, you, you want to share what you, you shared about the uh, the poetry by the Ravana River? You're on mute. There you go. Our internet is not very I'm good. So if you're River asking Trail, us, but also in my yeah. kind of city neighborhood in Belmont, people have been doing very subtle anonymous things like posting poems by civil rights era black American poets and just putting them on telephone poles. Um, along the Ravenna Trail, there was a memorial, a small, very tiny memorial on a bridge to George Floyd um, with a little book where you could write whatever you felt, but also an invitation to honor um, people that you had loved and lost as well. Um, so those very small little anonymous things I found to be very, uh, very touching, and very beautiful. No idea who's doing them. So. Lainey, there's a contribution in the chat. Um, someone is talking about uh, at Virginia Tech a few years ago, there was a stone for each victim. And that was sort of an organic response that the community created, but it became the final monument. Um, and and is wondering, you know, what what the final what the final monument in in maybe in Richmond will be. Yeah, that's a good question. That's such a great question. I mean, f for me, the most recent artivism that I've seen is in Richmond at the Lee Monument, the ballerinas, all the spray painting, um, the just the presence of the people, the coming together to create, and that's artivism in motion. It's sad a great deal to think that uh, the current system of governance feels it necessary to close that down rather than just stand back and wait and see what it becomes. But I love the idea that there would be uh, some kind of, uh, I don't know, contest is not the right word, but remember when there was the Vietnam Memorial, there was a lot of submissions and they chose a monument that would be right for that sorrow. Maybe there could be, you know, some kind of opening of dialogue or or place to put ideas for what that circle should become, as opposed to what it's been. I did learn recently through doing this that apparently there was an art show a couple of years ago. I'm not sure exactly where in Richmond, but there was a project where basically people did what they wanted to see up there already. I haven't seen any of the entries, but apparently that's been a thing already. Um, so it'd be kind of interesting to see what ideas they threw out there um, for their show two years ago. <laughs> um, hopefully was something awesome, right? <laughs> Yeah. There was just recently today, I saw on Instagram an image of an art exhibit that is down at the, um, by the river, w 
um, the Canal Walk, which is part of the slave trail, um, which is where the the people that were shipped from Africa would first set their foot on land in America, in Richmond, to go to the market. And um, they made all of these hands that are like in fists out of um, organic materials out of earth and um and it's just beautiful and then and so you the um it's so beautiful that um you can make a piece of art and then it can become another piece of art with the coupled with photography and then i mean dustin knows this from what's happening with with the, the monument so like layers and layers and layers and layers and I think for this like historical reconciling that that's such an impotent potent phenomenon does anyone else we have one minute left or actually probably you can just wrap up um, unless someone has something they really want to share I have to give a shout out to the people who have been living in trees <laughs> to block fracked gas pipelines and to say that that strikes me as a responsibly socially distanced direct action and one that lends itself particularly well to projection. And I believe that we should explore that. It's a great gas, gas and par powerful artivism happening uh, on the, the bottoms and sides of those uh, tree stands too, I believe. Cameron, you want to wrap us up? Let's do it. Big thanks for Lainey for leading us all into and through these important questions and creative challenges. And thanks again to Dustin Klein of Video Nutra for sharing his work and experiences with us tonight. A big thanks to all of you who are still here with us tonight and have joined us for the Street Scene Workshop series. Look for an email from us in the next week pointing your way to stay engaged with us in this work. As we finish our hour, I want to invite you to join us for our first monthly Sun Sing in Place concert on Thursday, July 23rd at 7 p.m. Live at Artivism Virginia on Vimeo, YouTube, and Facebook. Thank you for being with us in this workshop series and for joining us tonight. If you want to stay on past eight, we will hang to brainstorm some more. For those who need to go, stay safe, stay healthy, and stay in good trouble. <laughs> And speaking of good trouble, see the links below for bail funds to support across Virginia. Good night. We love you guys. Good night, everybody. This was wonderful. Thank you so much, Dustin. Thank you all. It was awesome talking to you guys. Really appreciate it. I'll uh, check in and yeah, hopefully see what, what you got going on next time. You know, oh, try to learn some yeah, <laughs>